All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Heavy Checklist Podcast. Guys, we are one of the fastest growing podcasts in the world, and it's not because of us. It's because of you guys, the listeners. What's happening is kind of a revolution. You people are listening to this podcast, and you're actually taking the notes, and you're implementing them in your daily life, which is blowing my mind. The messages, the emails, all the comments that we're getting from people that are actually doing the cold showers, they're changing their diet, they're being better employees, they're being better in their own business. Literally every single comment and message I get, I'm, I'm having people telling me that their lives are being changed because of the content that we're putting out. And guess what? When you tell us something like that, that means we're going to continue to create more and more quality content for you because if we know it's making an impact, we're going to be motivated and driven to do more of this because the truth is right now we're not getting paid to do this. We're not running ads. The only motivation we have to do this is to help share what has helped make us happy with you people. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening, subscribing, rating, reviewing. Everything that you've done to support this podcast has been phenomenal. Please continue to support us. Please continue to listen. Share with a friend. As you found out by now, this is not a podcast about trucks, vehicles, or anything that has to do with our TV show, Diesel Brothers. So what it's about is life. It's about how to become a better person, a better dad, a better mom, a better son, a better husband. Whatever you're trying to do better at, we're here to give you tips and trips. We're, gonna, we're not going to give you trips. Hopefully no trips at all. We're here to give you tips and tricks along the way to basically help you reach that final destination that you have. So... One important part of this podcast is, well, I've got two things that I want to share with you right now, okay? Number one, I ran a contest on my Instagram uh, over the summer, and I promised my followers that when I hit 2 million followers, I would be selecting one random winner to take home either my Polaris Slingshot or my Polaris General UTV. And the way it worked was this. You had to follow my page and then bring me three friends to follow my page, and I had thousands, hundreds of thousands of people participate in this contest. And right around New Year's, bam, we hit that 2 million mark. So guys, we are going to announce in this podcast, we have 10 finalists selected, and I'm just going to randomly scroll through the names and we're going to land on one. And I'm not going to be looking. Basically, the way I'm going to do is I've actually created a album in my iPad. And I'm going to take uh, these 10 screenshots of the usernames. And I'm going to scroll through it with my eyes folded. Uh, not my eyes folded. I'm going to do it with my eyes closed. And I might even fold them if I get, uh, if you guys get lucky. <laughs> And then I'm just going to close my eyes, stab the screen, and whoever I land on, you are the lucky winner. But here's the trick. We're not doing that until sometime during the middle of this podcast because I want you to listen to the podcast before you find out who the winner is. So I feel like that's a fair thing to ask. It's not I'm not asking you guys to just, you know, climb the Empire State Building. I'm asking you to just listen to the podcast, and you're going to find out who the winner of the slingshot or the UTV was. If you can climb the Empire State Building. Yes, please do that as well. <laughs> That's all right. We uh, that was a good there was a good cut before he talked. Okay, uh, next part. <clears throat> and then item number two is also another very important one because it's something that people have been requesting from us for a long, long time, and it's basically an opportunity to learn from me and my organization in a one-on-one -on -one setting. Meaning, I'm going to put together a workshop, a conference, a seminar, whatever you want to call it. This is going to be a two day event where I'm going to pull back the curtain on my business and I want to teach you guys how to run your own business online. And I don't care if you're a plumber or you're somebody selling, you know, uh, rocks and pebbles on the internet. I'm going to teach you my sales model. I'm going to teach you the sweepstakes model. I'm going to teach you how to run giveaways. I'm going to teach you how to build a good website. I'm going to teach you how to get influencers. I'm going to teach you how to do social media marketing. Literally everything that I have done that has made my online business grow from, you know, we did, I think, $300,000 the first year to now we do over $30, $40 million a year in online sales. I want to show you how to do that. And I'm going to open it up to an exclusive limited group of just 100 people. So 100 of you listeners, I'm going to give you the opportunity to come down to Las Vegas on February 15th and 16th and basically sit together with me and my basically instructors that I've assembled, and we're going to teach you how to make this happen. This is a paid opportunity. This is something that you're going to have to buy a ticket to. This is not a free class because it's not just free information. This is extremely valuable, extremely high-level information, and it's designed so that when you leave this workshop, you're supposed to literally the next day start making more money with your business. And I feel very confident that all of you who attend are going to be able to do that. So if you want to come to this conference and you want to come learn and you want to be in a more intimate setting, learning from me and my guys, 
I'm going to give you that opportunity. You need to go to heavydsparks.com, click on the tab that says Heavy Academy, and come learn with us because this will be the first time we've ever done this. I've never pulled back the curtain this far in our business to teach you guys how it works. So don't miss the opportunity. The website is live now. Go there, get registered, and let's make some more money. checklist podcast every single week i'm joined by some of my very best friends and every once in a while we get a very special guest this week we do have a special guest and i'm super excited about because not only is he a successful businessman he is a uh, adventurer a world traveler he's uh very kind of one of the most interesting men you'll ever meet uh, he's also a good friend of mine and he is heavy in the aviation field it's not diesel dave either oh, oh. yeah <laughs> nice try uh but before we get to my guest i would like to introduce obviously my best friend and co-host mr diesel dave Dave. What's up, everybody? That's it? That's, that's what you got? Yeah. Hey, I'm still here. I'm going to be here every week. You can't get rid of me that easy, so. And uh, next week, Diesel Dave and Kenny might each get their own microphone. Uh, DJ Marcus Wing did bring two microphones this week, but he did not bring a splitter cable, so that means that uh, old Kenny and Dave are still sharing a mic. It's, it's like been a long week. week. Dave's going to have two mics, and we're going to keep sharing. We're going to keep sharing. There's I was going to say. Next week, I get two mics. Sharing it, is caring. It looks yeah. like they're, uh, they're having a good time sharing, so because why you, take that away from and them? And why not put me in surround sound, right? Absolutely. I like that. Obviously, that brings us to our next uh, host, which is Mr. Kenny Thompson, world-renowned real estate guru. This guy buys and sells hundreds, if not thousands of properties every single year. He buys homes to rent. He buys homes to flip. He buys commercial properties. The dude has literally done it all, and he's been doing it by himself since a very early age. In fact, he started his business pretty much at the exact same time I started mine, right around the age of 21 years old. So together we have built our businesses side by side. We've borrowed money from each other. We've loaned money to each other. We have done every trick in the book that you had to do to build a successful small business. And uh, we're there. Kenny Thompson, uh, this man does millions and millions and millions of dollars every single week in real estate buying and selling. So Kenny, thank you. Uh, I am glad to be here. And I wish that every single thing that was true about what you just said, I mean, most of it is, but uh, you got to love what this environment brings out in each other. The best part about Dave is he's always going to lift you up. He's always going to make you sound better than you are. And with that uh, wonderful lead in, we're going to go right to my other longtime best friend. DJ, DJ Marcus Wink. I think we just hit the rev limiter. We hit the rev limiter we hit the on that one. Rev limiter on that one. <laughs> yep. That's uh, my uh, longtime best friend, audio engineer, co-host of the show, Mister. He didn't like to be called DJ Marcus Wing, but no, I mean, I mean, I mean, I'm building a brand, right? Yeah. I built a brand on DJ Marcus, and now I'm trying to get. I think it's staying. I don't know. I don't know what we're supposed to do here, but I, think, I feel I, like it's going to stick. I feel like DJ Marcus Wing is you. That's you. That's who right. you are. I mean, no need to change your brand. I've, when I've been trying to fight it this far. Don't I've fight it. What if we it. throw in big in front of that? Hey, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hey, Marcus Wing. How about big we just do this? DJ? This will determine who's the DJ. Okay. Who has a mixer in front of them and they're turning knobs right now? DJ Marcus Wing. I mean, this is more of an <laughs> interface than it really so, is like a, a DJ mixer. If you were but. here, you would see that Mr. D uh, DJ Marcus Wing is the one with the knobs and the buttons and the I wires. I do have an effect uh, app on my phone that I was going to incorporate in this episode with like hey, air horns. I and, like that idea, actually. That's yeah. not a bad idea. Cowbell. So Mr. Uh, DJ Marcus Wing is the man who puts the audio together. And then that leads us to our guest this week, who is, like I said, somebody who is extremely interesting. This man is one of the most interesting men I've ever met. And I met him because a couple years ago, I was trying to sell a helicopter. I'm going to give you a little backstory here. I was trying to sell a helicopter. This guy, Ryan McDonald, calls me up, shows up with his beautiful wife, Noe, and uh, jumps right in my helicopter. We go for a ride. Uh, I like this. I don't like that. Checking things out, bonking this, flipping that. We land and, he, and I'm thinking, all right, I got a deal. Like, this is it. Ryan continues to tear me a new asshole about my helicopter. He tells me how big of a piece of garbage this helicopter is and how it's about to fall out of the sky and how it's not safe. But, 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 here's the kicker. I knew we were going to be friends when he didn't just turn around and leave. He said, I'm not going to buy it, but I'll help you fix it. 
And so Ryan stayed an extra two or three days on his vacation or whatever it was, the test drive, and helped me work on this helicopter that had some serious safety issues that I didn't know I, about. I felt pretty bad. I so, didn't want you to be in the papers. No, you, you, so that's, that's how I met Ryan. And so obviously, Ryan, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thanks, man. Uh, a little background on Ryan is this guy has built a massive uh, helicopter operation up in central Washington that has now kind of extended down into Oregon, right? Yep. Uh, gone into California yet? Uh, we do a little bit in California in the northern area for frost protection, but primarily just the northwest. Yeah. You're one of the biggest operators in the northwest yep. as far as agriculture and all that stuff goes. So when you hear helicopters and farming, when I first heard it, I thought, how does that work? That doesn't make any sense. But basically what these guys do is they use a helicopter to spray chemicals on the field, whether it be fertilizer, pesticides, uh, whatever it is. And then they also use the helicopter to do something that's very unique that I didn't know about before I met Ryan and you dry cherries with mm-hmm. the helicopters. And so yeah. I thought, okay, you must spray some chemical and it dries them. No, no, you're literally just flying over the cherries, shaking the water off of them. And it's a big business, right? Uh, it is. It's a huge industry. Um, so yeah, you, you nailed it right on the head. We're, uh, we're supporting farmers and we use aircraft for a variety of different uh, tasks. So we support organic and conventional farming, forestry, which is really just big farming. And uh, one of the unique things he hit on is cherry drying. So cherry's a soft fruit. And uh, the real issue is that if the rain falls on the cherry, it water gets absorbed through the stem and it expands the fruit faster than the skin can stretch. So it cracks the fruit. Splits it. Splits it. And it does not hold well. So now it's a vector for bacteria. Fruit's perishable. It's gone. You lose your crop. So... And there's big money in cherry farming. There's big money in cherry because it's such a perishable crop it collects high dollar on the market. And so that window of time from June through August, May, June, into the end of August, so we have harvest, um, we just follow that harvest all the way from Northern Oregon, all the way to the Canadian border. And um, we're providing essentially an insurance policy. Basically they park a helicopter at a farm and these farms are massive. So each different area gets a helicopter parked at it and that helicopter is then on standby. Okay, so if it rains, the helicopter gets up, flies, and dries the cherries. If it doesn't rain, the helicopter just sits there. But guess what? It still gets paid to sit there. Yeah. How many helicopters are we talking? So my company, we operate nine aircraft. Um, Then we subcontract uh, other aircraft operators and owners like Dave. So we get Heavy's aircraft up there. I pay them uh, a fee as well. And I start acting as a broker. And so we could have anywhere from 25 to 30 aircraft at any particular location and time in the region. So we're not the only ones that do this. There are other companies, although we're by far the largest uh, operator that, that works as a, as a broker for protection too. And again, it, it really operates like insurance. Yeah. So when the farmer has us come do standby, that's basically paying your premium. And when it's time for rain and we go dry, that's like your deductible. Yeah. The and farmer so, has it built into his, his, his profits, into yep. his business model. He basically says, I, I'm going to spend X amount on insurance to keep my cherries from splitting. Mm-hmm. So it's really, really unique. And that's just one small piece of what Ryan's business is. But uh, to kind of touch on what Ryan said, I do have a couple of helicopters that have been up there working over the past couple of years. And Ryan has allowed me, he's provided me with a path to be able to justify owning helicopters, which is not something that is normally easy to justify because helicopters are just literally you think of a money pit they are the deepest darkest ugliest that would flaming... stop you from owning them. <laughs> yeah no they wouldn't but it's, it's given me a little bit of a little bit more of an excuse to own it and yeah. uh so my helicopters have actually made me money which is like really 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 hard to do believe it or not just because you own a helicopter doesn't mean you're making money with do you it. get up there and fly then as well so i've been up with ryan and we've done some training um i i like to train with his pilots because they are extremely skilled ag, ag pilots is what they're called are the, do you remember? Um, do you remember Men in Black? I do. Do you remember the crazy ag pilot who uh, flew his F sixteen up into the alien and yeah. saved the day? That's literally every ag pilot. But he was a crop duster. Um, the, is that Independence Day and, and yeah, Men not in Men in Black? Black. Independence Day. Yeah. I was wondering where we were going with that. All the Will Smith. Guy, all, Will all Smith. my Will Smith Will movies Smith. blur yeah. together. Independence Day with the crazy ag pilot. Yeah, that's literally go. every ag pilot ever. They are just laid back, easygoing, and they're flying under power lines. They're flying through tunnels. They're, I mean, these guys are 
nuts. So Ryan and his team are a safe nuts. A safe nuts. They're trained <laughs> and they're they're they literally just know how to work the aircraft in ways yeah. that nobody else can do. And it's phenomenal to watch them. So I love to go train with them because they teach teach you know the average pilot, a private pilot like me, what to do in a in a worst case scenario. So I've done, done a lot of emergency training, mountain flying. Anyways, that's how Ryan and I met. We've formed a great relationship over the past few years. Um, and I'm going to get into Ryan's business and his story a little bit and kind of help everybody understand what Ryan's done to be able to make his passion, which is flying, a career, which is, guys, I'm telling you right now, it's not, not always as easy as it looks. And it's not always as fun as it looks either, right? So here we go. Mr. Ryan McDonald, uh, walk us through a little bit of starting your helicopter business. I know you had some other ventures prior to this, right? You quickly rattle some of that stuff off that you did before you became a professional helicopter pilot and operator. Um, I was a professional skier, uh, raced snowboards on the U.S. snowboard team. I was a soldier in the Army. See, this is why I call you one of the most interesting men in the world, because <laughs> did you hear that? He was a skier on the U.S. ski team. Yeah, he snowboard. Was, we went to the U.S. snowboard team. Snowboard yeah. team. Mm -hmm. Do you ski or snowboard or both? I, I do both, yeah. Bob still sledding. Still skiing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he was just telling us off air about this one time he was running the Bob Sled in Chula Vista with old Donnie McBrasco, and he was just telling us all these. <laughs> Put a little motor on back. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ryan, obviously, uh, you were in the Army. Yep, I was in the Army. Let's, let's talk about your Army position for a minute, because <laughs> when you hear Army... You think combat, deployment, mm -hmm. you know, grinding through the trenches. You don't think about the guy who's on the posters giving the thumbs ups and the, the double shooters. That's Ryan. He <laughs> was, was the guy. Say, he's what? a handsome uh, so model. You were an army model? Well, Pretty much. Yes. Okay. So first of all, hat, hats off and, uh, and love and applause to all my battle buddies. Um, hardest working people out there uh, taking care of our freedom, you know. Um, I did go to the army. And I was there for seven years. So I was enlisted, uh, combat engineer. And so I was trained as a real soldier and uh, maintained all the qualifications that you have to do. But I was assigned to a very special unit. Uh, started out at Fort Carson at WCAP, which is the world-class athlete program. And something that was started during the Cold War uh, to kind of help with relations for Olympics and, and uh, you know, combating the Soviet Union and so forth. Really big on combative sports, taekwondo, boxing, um, uh, biathlon is really big. Our bobsled team is a huge Army and National Guard uh, team. So a lot of great athletes out there um, that are all actually soldiers, and they're full-time soldiers, and then they're Olympic athletes that are training through that program. Um, so kind of a cool, cool program to be a part of, and uh, being a part of the U.S. snowboard team allowed me to function in that capacity and still be a soldier and it was a so the snowboarding neat. and the army stuff were not tied together no not a, not originally um but i as i went in to the army that's where they that's where they melded yeah so it, you kind of helped with that relationship a little bit yeah um explain to me so basically rather than go out and be deployed and and obviously fight in overseas right you were going overseas and all these different places as an ambassador, basically showing the world what the army is capable of on the non-combat side of things. Sure. Right? So. Well, yeah. And, and actually that branched into a lot of other opportunities when I was in the army. So as an athlete, yeah, you're, you're an ambassador. Um, you're also showing some of the things that, you know, soldiers can do. You know, we are athletes and we have some real star role models that, actually are soldiers, which yep. is pretty cool. And we see that in some professional sports too, right? With football and, and so forth. So, um, it just kind of Pat Tillman, remember Pat Tillman, Yep. yep. the, uh, NFL player who just dropped it all to go up and, uh, yep. he joined the Ranger battalion. Yeah. Yep. And he was, he was actually KIA, yep. right? Yeah. That's so right. That's a, that's a cool that's a real hero there. Yeah, it really was. I mean, the guy was worth millions. And he said, when was it? It was that, it was Desert Storm that he, he went to, or it could have been Operation Iraqi Freedom. He just, he saw something one day and said, I got to go, I got to go be part of this. Yeah. Yeah. He enlisted he and became his, a ranger yeah. and, and uh, went for it. So yeah, it's a, a, a cool tool um, that they use to help with some public uh, awareness and, and interaction. Um, one of the things that that did lead into though, is uh, beyond athletics is being able to go out and and be involved in some other things. So we got involved in TV and working on uh, shows that showcase different military jobs. And uh, Ricky Schroeder from Silver Spoons, if you remember, mm -hmm. well, 
Silver Spoons is a little bit before it's a our little time. Before but, our time. Uh, he became a producer uh, later in life and has been working on these military shows, a real uh, advocate of military. And so we were working with the National Guard and the Army. And uh, so I hosted a couple of shows doing that. that well, contrary cool. to what you might think, you did not experience any aviation in the no, Army. No, 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 no. Zero aviation. Yep. How long were you in the Army? Seven years. Seven years. And you're starting to make a career out of it at that point. I, I considered doing that, actually. So one of my passions was to, as a, as a kid, I was not an athlete. The fact that I ended up in athletics at all or, or ended up skydiving or, or doing any of this other stuff is, I, I don't know, maybe just because I wanted to be like one of the cool guys. And so right. I took a few more risks. Um, but I was not athletic as a kid. Not even a little bit. But I mean, looking at you, you, I mean, for the listeners who can't see Ryan, and we will link uh, to his social profile so you can see who he is, but you're six foot, four, five, six. Yeah, six, four. Um, good build. Yeah. You're, you're lean. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're, you look athletic. Yeah. So was, did you not have an athletic build or did you not have the athletic ambition? I, I didn't have the genes. When I graduated high school, I was like 5'11", and the only hair on my body was on my head. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't Dang. shave till I was 22. Post high school. Late, so basically, sure. what, well, you're a late bloomer. Uh, I was a late bloomer. Needless to say, I was not great at team sports in high school. Yeah, me neither. So ever. Yeah. So a different different path. Uh, uh, yeah. It's just. I mean, so basically, crazy how things work out. From there, from the army, you went out, and your family had a construction business, kind mm-hmm. of a family construction business. You probably dibbled and dabbled in that a little bit. Oh yeah. Uh, that led into, uh, I believe you told me, a granite company where yeah. you learned how to source granite slabs from China, uh-huh. and you built up this big business, and then you finally got to that point that every business owner gets to where it's like, do I go all the way in the deep end, or do I turn around and go back to the shallow end and reevaluate things? And you decided to turn around. I did. Because it wasn't your passion. Yeah, so I, I was actually still racing, um, and I knew my career, you know, I wasn't winning every race. And I, I was in the top 16 a few times in, in the world cup, but I wasn't, I wasn't the, Is you know, the banner snowboard? guy snowboard. Okay. Yeah. What yeah. do you, pre- uh, just total side note, what yeah. do you prefer to do now? I ski most of the time now. You Why? just get around easier, get around easier. It's frustrating on a board. I'm, I'm sorry, all my snowboard buddies, but it is frustrating snowboarding with skiers. Yeah. Because it's just, you can't traverse and move around. And you so, almost get a little claustrophobic just being strapped in. <laughs> well, I mean, your feet there's are some there. days, there's some days that surfing the pow is undescribable, but, um, yeah, there's just, I'm, I'm really vested in ski education now. Right. Uh, and so there's just a high need for, for skiing in that particular segment. So I, I spend a lot of time clinicking and, and teaching and stuff. So nice. So that kind of, uh, that is what brought out the athlete, athlete in you, right? That's how you oh, yeah. became athletic. That's how you learned how to train. That's how you learned how to build a lean body that you have, mm-hmm. obviously, now. And, and you stay in good shape. But I think the part that we all want to get to, which is kind of the meat and potatoes of who you are now, how did you – why helicopters? Yeah. Well, so my uh, childhood passion, you know, when you set out and you go, what do you want to be when you grow up, uh, was I wanted to be a dentist. <laughs> <laughs> when, when my mom, <laughs> yeah. How does that lead to helicopters? Yeah, that's so uh, far from the helicopter. So when my mom asked, well, why do you want to be a dentist? Yeah. Explain your childhood that led you to that. Yeah. <laughs> Late bloomer. Did you like not play cops and robbers and stuff? No. Uh-uh. Uh, did you have a normal childhood? I, I think I had a really normal childhood. Almost too I normal. do. I, I think that was a problem. It was so that too... made you want to be a dentist because that was normal. That was that normal. Makes sense. Yeah. I just wanted a good, clean job, which I think came. My, my family's got four generations of uh, builders, so but growing did you up, like going we to the all dentist? do that. What's that? Did you like going to the dentist? I, actually, I didn't, which was one of my drives of wanting what? to be a dentist. I know it's a weird psychology. You want to make dentistry fun. <laughs> I you I should gonna, be a dentist did and you a clown have fun today, Dave? I, yeah, I, 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 we can talk about that because ironically, I, enough, he I was the at the dentist yeah. today uh, and I was thinking about how to make the process more fun and I have some ideas. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, uh, I went through an experience that, that um, transformed me a little bit too. I didn't have uh, the greatest grill growing up, if you will. So I had uh, chiclet teeth and snaggle tooth. But the one he has on now, though, is, is top notch. Uh-huh. Oh, those are all fake then or what? Or you just got no, straight out. Real touch. They look. I see them. Yeah, I don't need great. to touch, touch them. Right there. Yeah. So, I didn't realize how much um, your 
perceived self-worth and self-esteem sometimes reflects around your smile and your confidence. Mm-hmm. And when I was really young, I met somebody who went through a transformation like that. And I saw personality-wise how it changed them. And then I started learning how much oral health really affects your total health. And I thought, you know, there is a way that I can affect people's lives in a positive way that nobody else can do for them. And I can make that experience joyful where you, you know, everybody thinks going to the dentist is like, oh no, that's yeah. the last thing I want to do. It's painful. It's scary. You can't see what's going on. It's uncomfortable. Um, and so, yeah, I wanted to change that. And that's what was intriguing to me. How old were you when you were thinking all this? Yeah. (laughs) I mean, when I was like, you know, that age, I didn't know what the hell I wanted to do. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, and you, you got deep right there. I I got honestly, how how, how old were you? I was a little nerdy. Um, I just, I I knew early that that was a profession I wanted to pursue. And I think I was really concrete at about 10. Yeah. Wow. 10, 12. Yeah. Pre-middle school for sure. How bad were those teeth then? I mean, I mean, it wasn't obscene. You wouldn't wince and look away. You know, I didn't wear a bag to <laughs> class, but, but it, you know, I didn't have great genes. So I'm missing teeth. I had primary teeth, so your baby teeth. Right. I had those into my adulthood. I still have two of them. Huh. Um, so just genetically, I was missing some teeth, and there were spaces and twists and, you know, just... Sounds like my mouth. You know, it wasn't... I had, this, I had braces for nine years. Yeah, nine it's horrible. Nine years. Yeah, because I had a twisted tooth. They were trying to twist around, and the, oh man, all the work was done in the first three years. And he's like, "Let's twist that tooth." And six it's years three later, years. six years later, he's like, "I can't twist it." So uh, my kids leave. are out of college now. Uh, I guess uh, we're uh, done. Senior year, <laughs> senior year, I got my braces <laughs> off, dude. It was like, if anybody's brutal. looking into alternatives for getting their teeth fixed, go play softball. Have your whole front row knocked out. They'll put in some veneers, a fresh boom, set. You know what I'm done. saying? And nice. bam, yeah, I like it. You get friends. some pearly whites. Those look good. I, I, you know, they look a lot better than they did. So, so Ryan, how did you go? Sorry. How did you go from, when did you drop the dentist bag? When did you move on from that? Not so long ago. Oh, so you were still pursuing a great experience. Yes, I was. So, all right. So I want to be a dentist. I'm not an athlete. I'm actually a super academic, uh, focused. I, I graduated high school with my two year degree from college. Wow. Uh, and a running start program, which is actually pretty prominent in, in uh, Northwest now. And I think some other states do it where they allow you to take some college credits and when you're in high school. So I was one of the pioneer flights of that as a participant. Um, and I was going right to college, man. I was like, I'm going to go to school. I'm going to be graduated. I'll have my own practice before I'm 30. Like I've, I've got this licked. The dream. The dream. So then I start skiing more <laughs> and I... To be able to ski, I had to teach because then you get free lessons, you get deals on gear, and you get a free season's pass. So I'm going to the college and high school. I set up all my classes in the morning, so I'm done at 11. I go teach for two hours in the afternoon for my free pass, and I take clinics at night, and they help me teach, you know, and get better at skiing. It's, it's lessons for the teachers. So I'm doing this. And our, our director at the time, our assistant director, snowboard director, said, hey, um, we're thinking about going to Willamette Pass, a little, little resort in, in, uh, in Washington. They got a snowboard race. So all of us instructors are going to go and participate in this race for fun, you know, just because it'd be cool. And I'm like, yeah, that sounds, that sounds pretty cool. So I go to this race with all of them, and, uh, and it turns out I did pretty well. I won. I was like, oh, well, the snowboard racing thing's kind of cool. So... I got kind of hooked on that. And so I start shortening my class schedule <laughs> and my priorities start shifting a little bit. And so I start pursuing uh, snowboarding. And I did that pretty late, uh, like 17, mm. you know, was when I started really snowboarding. At age 17. At age 17, yeah. yeah. And so that year we pursued some more races and I qualified for nationals, had a great time. And at the end of nationals, I got approached by the national team and they said, Hey, you know, you qualified for this, uh, development program for juniors. Um, would you like to be a part of it? I'm like, yeah, of course I am. Cause I've, I was never an athlete before this. So that just kind of set the groundwork. So I started snowboard racing when I got done, uh, right before. So I retired right before the Vancouver Olympics. Um, I went back to school. And during this time, 
you know, winding back. I spent seven years in the army. I had my GI bill. So I get out and I go back to school to be a dentist. And right before I started registering for classes, I was kind of ho-humming about my career. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm feeling really down about myself. My whole identity at this point is built around this one accomplishment that uh, really defined me. Do you it, think th- adrenaline has something to do with that? You'd experienced a lot oh, of adrenaline yeah. with snowboarding. And, it does and, now, for sure. And when you look back and you're like, dentistry is not a high adrenaline thing. Yeah. No, I turned into a junkie. So snowboarding ran me to, uh, so I started skiing more. I did some skier cross. I started skydiving. Yeah. Um, I got into paragliding. Um, I, I just started getting into, I was rock climbing. Uh, I raced amateur motocross and got invited to a couple nationals, which was crazy because I almost killed myself. So snowboarding was the gateway drug. G- gateway drug, man. For sure. It opened so many crazy doors. Yeah. It's unreal. And and to be able to be around high-level athletes from other sports. It's addicting. Is re- yeah, yeah, it is. It's yeah. addicting. You thrive on being a part of that culture. So when I decided to retire, I'm low. My now wife is a friend. And I'm like, ah, you know, I don't know what to do. I'm 32. Uh, and she's like, well, why don't you go back to school and be a dentist like Dude, you wanted 32. to? 32. Let's talk about that for a second. Uh huh. That feels like a late start for a lot of people. 32. I mean, oh, yeah. especially in Utah. Utah, you're supposed to be married, have kids, and on your way about like 26. Uh-huh. So you're halfway that's, to retirement. That's there. the Utah culture. Yeah. Now, when I think about 32, for me, 32 is just a couple of years ago. So, and, and, and it's scary. Yeah. If I were to tr- have to start over at 32, that'd be terrifying. Uh huh. And that's kind of where you were. I would completely starting over um, because the path that I had invested my whole life in up to this point was snowboarding. And what it was coming to the realization was I wasn't going to be the best guy out there. I wasn't going to be the champion. And to make any real money. I wasn't going to make any money. Yeah, so. <laughs> Even if I was the best, snowboarding doesn't pay. Right. So uh, you, you chose this path of, of, of kind of following your passions, right? Yeah. These, these hobbies and all that. I mean, looking back, you don't have any regrets on that, right? No, man. And now you get to use that passion yeah. and you build a business that you love and enjoy and you still get to have that adrenaline, mm-hmm. right? I yeah. think that is such a, like a cool... You know, it's kind of a cliche that, that people say, like, if you never want to work a day in your life, follow your passion, you'll find success. Man, I, I, everything that has worked out for me has been through following a passion and just being open-minded to the, the experiences that are being thrown at you. So why, why is that a cliche? I mean, I feel like that should be like a, a like a common rule. It's a cliche You're because right. there's a lot of negative attached to it as well. Uh, when people, in my opinion, when people follow their passion, they only follow their passion and they forget the other side of that, which is work. Oh, hard, hard work. And it's going to be 10 times harder than any other traditional path because tr- there's a reason why people don't always get paid to do what they love because it's damn hard to do. That's so right. in order to get to that point, you got to grind, grind, grind. So I really want you to kind of walk us through this year of being 32 because my guess is that there's some listeners out there that are probably in this age range, still trying to find their rhythm, still trying to find their stride. What, what did you do next? So I go to school and uh, I'm doing all my prereqs for dentistry. I'd already had a two-year degree and stuff, so I didn't have a ton of work to do. I had two years of schoolwork. So I'm cranking all this stuff out, and uh, I'm actually working uh, in a dental office, you know, observing and everything, doing all the stuff you got to do to check the boxes to get into dental school. And, um, and I like it. I'm not in love with it. I'm in love with the idea still, mm-hmm. but the, the process, like a lot of processes, are not fun. Right. right? I mean, it's a grind. And my kid's sister, actually, Stacy. Uh, is going to school and going through this process. She got rejected as a straight A student to go to dental hygiene school. Wow. And when I started going back to school, I'm like, Stace, don't worry about it. Just be a dentist. She's like, no, I didn't even get into hygiene school. And I'm like, don't worry about it. And my dad told her to. And so boom, she went back to school to be a dentist. Uh, So we're going through this process. Uh, I go and apply to dental school I had an okay DAT score. The DAT's something you take, like the MCAT, if you're going to be in med school, lawyers have one. It was, it was a mediocre score. You know, I probably would get in, but I was waiting for interviews. And uh, a guy landed at the airport not far from my house. Uh, my neighbor is a pilot. Uh, Ray got me into just doing some fixed wing flying with a, with a little plane, which was fun. It was a natural transition from being a skydiver. Um, and I was having a great time with it. So I was up there one day with him. 
and a guy was coming to dry cherries hmm. in this little Schweitzer helicopter. I'm like, man, it'd be super cool. I want to do a helicopter lesson. And I'm on break waiting to get into dental school and get acceptance letters and interviews, right? So uh, I go over there and I'm like, well, how, do you do lessons? And he's like, yeah, yeah, I, you know, it's, uh, I, I, we can do a flight, an introductory flight and stuff. So for those of you listening, a Schweitzer looks like a helicopter that they started on the front and didn't finish the back. Yeah. It's yeah. like got a really nice looking windshield and then you, behind that, the engine's literally just hanging out in With the sky. With a stick. Well, yeah, and, <laughs> and, and then it's, trail. I mean, it's, it's, it's a great little helicopter, yeah. but it's terrifying to look at and it's not a powerhouse and it's no. definitely a very beginner's helicopter. Yeah, it's a great trainer. It's yeah. a really common trainer. Um, Schweitzer 300C, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep, that was the one. A lot of people have started in that uh, airframe. So I, I get with this guy. I fly one hour, we sit down, and he goes, well, how is that? And I go, how much time do you got? So where that goes is I ended up spending 11 hours with him oh, flying. You asked him how much time he has right then and there. Uh, right then and there. Oh, I see. I was hooked, man. Yeah. I was hooked. It was so challenging. Yeah. And I was just drawn to how you could manipulate airspace and do anything you wanted. It Another was so thing cool. that a lot of the listeners and most people don't realize is a, flying a helicopter is difficult and complex, but B, hovering a helicopter is extremely difficult and extremely complex because what you don't understand, um, the way a helicopter works is when you're hovering, that's when you're actually using the very most power the helicopter has yep. because it's basically like picture yourself treading water in a fast current river or something like that. That's what you're doing. Now, when you're flying in a helicopter, you're basically got a life jacket on and you're just going with the river. That's how it's going. You're not really swimming. You're not really doing the work because the helicopter kind of turns into a plane and starts to fly rather than sitting there having to exert so much energy. So it's, it's important for people to realize that because a lot of people look at helicopters and think that it's just some magical machine that you push a button and go. No. You have to have extremely good hand-eye coordination and you have to just have a good, like, you're either a good pilot or you're not. Like a lot of guys, a lot of bad pilots try to be good pilots, but ultimately they wind up flying for the airlines. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There might be some truth to that. Uh, that's a great analogy though. I love the river life jacket and treading water. I'm going to use that one. That's a really good analogy. It's exactly right. That, I mean, it is. You think no, about it. It's, it is exactly right. Uh, I did 11 hours cause I ran out of money at that point. Yeah. And went, he was oh, charging you training per hour. Yeah. And how much was somewhere? That? It's, the, it's a little over 300 bucks an hour. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And I was in school. And that is dirt cheap. Yeah. And so for me to scratch out 3300 bucks to go spend on a weekend, what it, what, like, what I was mental. <laughs> Almost that was like, the stupidest thing I could have like ever done. It felt like a weekend in Vegas. It's about what it felt like. Just like guilt afterwards. Super high. Yeah. And you're just yeah. adrenaline. And you get done and you're like, what have I done? Mm -hmm. What is the average cost per hour? It's like, oh. it's like, what, 1400 Depends. Well, it depends on the aircraft. So a training aircraft right now, I think you're probably looking at 350 start rate for an R-22 or something. So so you charge us way more than that, though. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> well, there's a difference between a turbine helicopter and a piston, which we'll get into. But yeah. So with these 11 hours, you're thinking, this is amazing, but I also just spent $3,300 I didn't have. Oh, right, yeah. So then, brisne uh, brisness, my business brain kicks yeah. in, right? So I go, huh, I need to figure out how to fly a helicopter. And not only that, but how James Bond would it be to land your own helicopter in your front yard? Yep. So that became my goal. I'm like, I am going to make that happen. Was that on your vision board? <laughs> I, and do you have a vision board? Uh, so I do actually have a vision board now, but at yeah, the time, yeah. at the time, I didn't realize that that's what I was doing. I was yeah. utilizing that tool, but I wasn't doing it in a the formal, literal term, yeah. formal term. Um, but I verbally committed that that was my goal. Yeah. I told others that I was going to make that happen, and then I focused on it. So real quick, last week, um, you haven't heard this episode yet, and I'll, I'll share it with you, but uh, I shared some affirmations. Mm -hmm. Back 2011, I recorded some positive affirmations, which at the time were really bizarre and like goofy. And I recorded it and, and dubbed it over to Enya soundtrack. And I played it for these guys last week. And it's wait, really, wait, you did affirmations yeah, to a on. soundtrack. Yes, yes. Let's Think, take a beat things like, things like <laughs> me saying, I am strong. I am healthy. I am positive. It's and then I put Enya sounds. in the background Enya. and yeah, you'll hear it. Yeah. It's amazing. But one of nice. my affirmations in 2011, when I had no money, I was just recently married, had just found out we were pregnant with our first kid. One of my affirmations says very clearly, I will own and fly a helicopter one day. 
And it was like very clear and like nice, as dude. like as like nice. as like clear as day. And yeah. now obviously I've got you do it. four. Yep. Can we take a minute and, and talk about those affirmations? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, the listeners... <laughs> because on, we kind of just I'm carried on pink. after that. <laughs> if you have not heard the affirmation, uh, Affirmations episode, I strongly suggest you listen to it. It was an excerpt from the Greg Godfrey episode. I think it's episode five called uh, Quick Hitter Affirmations. Listen to it. Speaking of that, when are you going to be ready for your cage fight? That is another thing. Oh, that I put was that in there? On my affirmations. No. I that said I will have at least one thing. cage fight in my life. Right? Oh, right. Just to let you know. no way. Just to let you know, I'm almost done setting it up. That's so. Well, be ready. I did, I did this to myself. And Diesel Dave, what, what do we have in store for him? A little surprise? It's a definitely a surprise. I'm not going to I'm not going to tell him. Please tell oh, me he wait, weighs wait. significantly Can, less it, than me. It is going to be rem- uh, very I memorable. Have, I have a few different people. Oh, and it depends you, on if you, you want really to drop your weight down to 205 or if you want to stay where you're at. Oh. Can I be what I weigh now and fight somebody around the 140, <laughs> buck, buck 60 range? Wait, wait, Those fights are sanctioned. Bring a friend. Uh, hey, hands, yeah. what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, hands, you're up. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, you probably don't know what that sound means, but you're about to find out this means that we're about to announce the winner of the Polaris Slingshot or the Polaris General Giveaway. This is the moment that you've all been waiting for. This is the moment yeah, yeah. that you came. Oh, what? Home this run. Maybe oh, yeah. the moment that some of you, the only reason you listen to the podcast, and so we're going to give it to you right don't now. Don't say that. We are going to select out of 10 finalists randomly one of these people is going to be taken home a brand new polaris slingshot or a polaris general and the reason why you people were entered into this contest for those of you who didn't enter was i ran on my instagram heavy d sparks and when we hit two million followers i promised that anybody who followed my page and brought me three friends was going to get a chance to win and then i also gave our podcast listeners three bonus entries which we have a few of the names here on this list three bonus entries for a chance to win. So if you follow my page and you left a review or a rating on our podcast, you have three names in the hat. Your name three times, basically. So I'm going to start right now without any further ado. Number one finalist, Michael Sullivanoff. 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 Michael Sullivanoff. There you go. Yeah, Michael. Finalist. Special wrestler. Number two, Alex Johnson. And his handle is Alex Johnson Bro. Bro. Ah, bro. Bro. Finalist number three, Glenn Lovelace, a.k.a. at glove00. Ooh, damn, G-Love. sounds like a rapper. I like Hello. that guy. What's up, glove? That's a, that's a radio name. Then we've got Cash Bizzle. Ooh, Cash Bizzle. Uh, his username is Cash A Money. They must Shout be in a to rap Cash group together. Money. Next yeah. up, we've got Bizzle. Mitch Gibbs, uh, at WM underscore Gibbs. Then we've hey, got... Mitch. Uh, John O'Reilly, and his username is O'Reilly. One, two, O'Reilly. Nice. Auto parts. You got yourself yeah. a jingle already, that was O'Reilly. So harmonic. <laughs> Ooh, then we, next up, we've got Jason Main, and his username is simple. It's just at Jason Main, M A Y N. Next up, oh, we've got ourselves a first lady on the list. Ooh. Hannah Lewis. Yeah. What is it? Ladies. That's, what was that? Was that a. I think it was like supposed to be like a steamboat air horn. Oh, Sally, like a hair clipper. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's always going to buzz. Yeah. God. Somebody was manscaping. Hannah Lewis. <laughs> Hannah so it's Lewis. underscore Hannah Lewis underscore. That is her username. Hannah, 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 my friend, good luck. You are the first lady on the list yeah, here. Yeah, congratulations. Which brings us to our next finalist, which is Justin Graff, a.k.a. JGraff00. Well, that's two usernames that end in double up. And then we've got our final finalist, which is another young lady that goes by the name of Casey Walters Gerber, a.k.a. Brown-Eyed Oaky Girl. Brown-Eyed Oaky Girl. Are you guys ready for this? Ah I'm just going to get scrolling. uh, My eyes are closed. I'm cruising through. I'm going back and forth. I'm just going through the album. I have no idea who I'm looking at. And I'm going to land on Michael Selivanoff. Michael Selivanoff, my friend, are the winner. You now have the opportunity to choose from my personal Polaris Slingshot or Polaris General. You're going to be taking that home. And if if we can verify that you actually brought three friends to follow my Instagram page, each one of those friends, like I promised, is going to be getting $2,500 cash. What? 
Yeah. yeah. Michael, so, it's your lucky day. Here's Whoa. the deal. I just gave away like I need 30, friends 000. like Michael. Yeah. I just gave away like $30,000. And this is not the last time we're going to be doing this. Guys, if you listen to this podcast and you want a chance to win big stuff like this and you want your friends to win big, big stuff, stay tuned to either the podcast or my Instagram, which is where I you know keep up-to-date information. So it's at Heavy D Sparks. And somebody... In fact, a lot of people are going to be winning a lot of cool stuff. So thank you for everyone who participated, and good luck to everybody on the next giveaway that we run. And with that said, we're back to our regularly scheduled podcast with Mr. Ryan McDonald. So, so Dave introduces all of us every week, right, guys? And after the affirmations, I realized, you know what? We didn't take a minute to actually, uh, you know congratulate Dave on that um, moment of feeling vulnerable oh, yeah. and, and, and talk about the reason he did that and was willing to put himself out there and the positive effect that it has had on others. I mean, it is, this is probably going to be talked about for the next several podcasts. Not to mention that almost every single item that he was, you know, talking about was checked off. Oh, yeah. Which, I mean, if you could have seen all of our faces, because that was the first time we had all heard it. No, oh, I have everything on my list. Yeah, but it's like everything was like, oh my gosh. Except for the cage we, fight, we, we and, got to and I haven't met Tony Robbins. But, you but it's all checked off the, the list. Original, you played the original track yes. from so his I, yes, phone. So this it. all came up because I was looking through my emails That's so a, week, a couple weeks ago, and I was looking at affirmations because I wanted to share the affirmations concept. And boom, this audio clip that I'd emailed to myself pops up, and I'm like... Wow. Because oh. I, I hadn't listened to it. I listened to it for five years straight. So basically from 2011 to 2015, 16, I listened to this audio clip every single day. Last few years, I haven't listened to it because I found other ways to, you know, do my affirmations yeah, yeah. and stuff. And I kind of forgot about it. But it was always in the back of my mind. When I saw it, I was like, oh, shit. I can't not share this. I have I to. I love that you and shared I, that I with them. I hated sharing it because, dude, when I even, like, I talked about being on road trips with friends and it was uh. on my iTunes and it would, like, start playing, I would hurry and like throw my phone out the window and like stop that track. Like nobody needs to hear this because it's, it's very personal. Yeah. Nothing crazy personal, but just very like me being very, uh, optimistic with myself. And yeah. Stuff and that it's, like it's kind of, sometimes people think of it as kind of a corny concept, right? It's like, very corny. If like, you, oh, I'm, I'm listening to myself. Tell me I'm, I'm strong and I'm success. You know what? You got to fill your head with what you want to be in there. If you fill your head with garbage, you're going to get out garbage. Well, the problem that I've always had, and it's not a problem. The thing I've always had is I, I, I'm not very good at lying to myself. I've tried to convince myself of big stories and lies in the past, and I'm not very good at it. So <laughs> I used it to my benefit because yeah. I told myself all these things and I couldn't convince myself that they weren't true. They had to be true. Mm -hmm. and, and I couldn't lie to myself. And so I couldn't live with the fact that I had told myself all these grandiose things but never accomplished them. So that's really like subconsciously my brain was always pushing, pushing, pushing. And that's what pushed me through the walls and through the dark days of building a business, which we're going to get back to on your yep. story. Um, you know, it's, it's tricky. So things like that have pushed me along the way. And, and I think subconsciously we do those. Like you had, you made that your mind up. I'm going to have a helicopter and land in my backyard. I know for a fact I landed in your backyard a month or so ago. Yeah, in yeah we do it all so the time now. You've accomplished it. How did you get there? So, uh, I so I'm thinking, okay, well, how can I make this happen, right? So I start dreaming up a business model around the one that was presented to me by the guy I took the lesson from, right? I mean, he was there to dry cherries. Now my family are come from farmers and builders, so my dad has a little cherry orchard, and I thought, okay, if I got around, you know, three or four of these contracts, was able to get a helicopter that was inexpensive, mm -hmm. cheap, because. I just spent the last $3,300 I had and I don't have anything <laughs> left. Uh, how am I going to come up with money to buy a helicopter? That's absurd. Right? And I mean, they're cheap? hundreds of thousands of dollars. What's cheap for like the first helicopter well, it purchase? it turns out about $70,000 is cheap. Which should be your first red flag if you're looking at uh, <laughs> helicopters, everybody. If it's a bargain. If it's a bargain, there's a reason. Yep. Mm. Was that the uh, Hiller? That was the, the Hiller B model, yeah. Franklin 210, wood blades. Uh, wood blades. Yep, wood blades. Yep. For, for like the, the, the For the main rotor yeah. blades. Yeah, yeah, yeah main wooden. rotor blades. Are oh, wood. Now, was the yeah. Hiller the based off like the Bell 47 Army trainer? So uh, Bell and um, Francis uh, Fairchild, Hiller, uh, they both were vying for the contract for the U.S. Army and to yep. create a A little bit of background. Helicopter. Uh, going into Vietnam, the U.S. military needed a trainer helicopter that they could then transition pilots into the Hueys. 
uh, this is pre Huey. Huey hadn't even been invented yet. Yeah. Uh, so they just needed a helicopter and they wanted it for evac. Oh, and they yeah. wanted to put, uh, the, the requirement was to put a litter carry. And Hillers were piloted from the middle because the CG of the aircraft allowed them to put a litter on each side. CG is center of gravity. That's right. Which is helicopters revolve around center of gravity. Yep. So that was the, oh boy, you guys are getting comfortable. I'm, I'm just watching Diesel kicking that his time. feet up. I, I, I think Kenny's going to start rubbing his feet. Yep, right through the boots. Uh, so, and, and then, so Bell put out uh, a prototype as well. And this is, this is how the governments work. They, they put out a, a, a build. The companies build their best prototypes, and the government selects what they're going to build. Um, for whatever reason, it was thought that the Hiller design was actually a superior design, but they went with Bell, and they had a hydraulic rotor head system. So because Bell initially got that first contract, that launched them into business right. and allowed them to develop other aircraft, and that's what actually led to the Huey down the road. Right. Without them getting that contract, Bell wouldn't even be here today. I mean, honestly, the, the fact of the matter is, had Hiller got that contract, we'd be flying Hiller Jet Rangers. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. And actually, they made a aircraft, the FH 1100, I think is what they called it, that looked just like a Jet Ranger, and they were vying for that same contract again later as competitors. Hiller just honestly probably just wasn't good enough buddies with the right people. No. He did get a Canadian contract, though. Hmm. Yeah. What yeah. is that? A Canadian contract. A Canadian okay, contract, gotcha. yeah. You said, you said it like a Canadian. Oh, oh. He said like Canadian, Canadian, eh? Like Canadian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eh? Canadian. Yeah. It yeah, wasn't so. quite as uh, lucrative as a U.S. contract to Vietnam, ironically, but... Um, so you ended up with one of these bastard child helicopters that didn't make the cut for no. the U.S. military. Yeah. It was good enough for me. <laughs> good enough for you. There's a reason why it was cheap. Oh. Uh, two seat, three seat? Uh, you can put three people in there, but if there's more than... A small child and a man at sea level when it's cold out, you're not flying. Yeah. So uh, it was grossly underpowered. It was a pipe dream. Um, there was a guy on the airfield who steered me towards the hiller as well that flew them, and he was going to be my pilot to fly these contracts. Because you have to be a pilot and have right. a commercial rating, right? you got to be a professional to earn money flying an aircraft, which I clearly wasn't. Toy. That was going to be my weekend toy. I was going to learn to fly, go to dental school, Everything was great. Right. So I have no money. So I hocked a few things, got some jingle in my pocket, went down to the local bank <laughs> and was like, hey, I got this great idea. I'm going to get a helicopter. I have these contracts. What do you think? And they gave me the money. So I leveraged everything else that I had to go get this helicopter. Yeah. And the business model was sound in my mind. I was going to have the helicopter. This was probably right close to the recession too, right? Uh huh. What year was this? Oh, oh perfect time. Yeah, yeah. How old are you now? Uh, um, please, come my on. Bad. My bad. Ah, I'm 39. Thir okay, so this was <laughs> seven years ago. This was right coming out of the recession. So banks yeah. were a little tight. Yeah, seven eight years ago. Money yeah. to guys with helicopters. Yep, yep. Um, so I, I I pulled that off. I had the contracts. Had the guy fly it, and basically I got it from Canada. I brought a a, a pilot with me to ensure that it was a good aircraft. And I brought a mechanic with me to look at the, the log books because I don't know anything. Blind ambition. And I thought I was doing all the right things. Turns out the helicopter had some falsified log Eesh. stuff. Uh, it wasn't in flying order. The engine went out. And by the way, we found out all this after I had the contracts. Oh. Yeah. So, you know, I'm from a small community. I live in Washington. Um, your word is your... Like that's your your name is your bond. Like yeah, your yeah, word, yeah. Right? No, I can't flake on this. So I have to think outside the box a little bit. And so now my full focus is on how I'm going to fulfill these contracts. So I end up leasing a better, more powerful Hiller, a later model that's more capable uh, to do these contracts. And I do it at a rate that after insurance, paying my pilot, and getting it up there and paying the lease, I'm hoping that I'm going to break even and not lose money. <laughs> Great business model. Yeah. Meanwhile, you have a seventy thousand dollar Hiller that you a lemon. A lemon that I'm yeah that I I'm like every spare second I'm coaxing the mechanic to go out there and tell me what I can do next and how do we fix this and getting that and I'm just 
Now I'm just doubling down, man. I'm at the casino. <laughs> I'm just throwing a quarter and a dollar in the slot, pulling the handle, waiting for the numbers to line up. Just, I'm going to make it work. I'm going to make it work. And I'm sun up to sundown, 24 7, seven days a week. I'm literally at the hangar or li- staying at the hangar, trying to get my helicopter Is that the, flying. Lake Chelan? Yeah. Same one where you're at now? Uh, right next door. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I- I'm just pouring every human ounce of energy into making this work so that I can fulfill the contracts and get out from this. Because you wanted out. Completely done? I was like, well, I I wasn't even thinking that long term. I was just thinking short term. I need to to get through this season. I need to own my obligations and I need to work. I need to will this to succeed. So what, uh, what, what changed? How did it turn the corner for you? Um, I, um, some days I wonder if it has turned the corner. I'm still doing the same things, <laughs> willing things to succeed. Yeah. Uh, so I, you know, we end up getting through that year. And so, you know, what any smart guy does when he has a bad experience, you turn around and do the same thing again and double down. <laughs> Obviously, yeah. <laughs> I'm on yeah, the hook. I'm like, well, no, it could never be that bad. You're again. talking to the guy who hurts himself yeah. literally every time he gets on a dirt bike. <laughs> yeah. You're like, oh, that felt pretty bad. Let me try it. What's the odds that I'm going to kill myself twice, right? Right. Yeah. So he's speechless. He said nothing. That's Marcus. Yeah. Name, by the way, I just don't want my wife to hear more about it. It's you Mr. Know. Mr. Injury himself. So uh, I, I, I looked open the mailbox. I did not get into dental school my first round. Uh, my sister then reapplied, and I was on my route to reapply, and I never got that far because I was working on plans of how I was going to do twice the contracts the next year because I'm going to have my helicopter and another leased helicopter, only this time at a rate that I can actually make money. Yeah. So I'm doubling down. Because you did fulfill your first year contracts, and you I got did. out alive. Yes, barely. You made uh, the farmers paid you, yep, yep. and you you thought I can make money at this if I sharpen the pencil and get good at it. Yes. Were the farmers happy? Did everything go well on that end? They never really knew that there was an issue, which That's is, um, you know, f- for me that has always been uh, a real driving point: is that the customer is always satisfied, everything is great, and there's no need to, um, I guess make them worry or, right. f- or lose any confidence in you unless it's something that's, that could potentially be, you know, damaging. Like if I'm supposed to pick your kids up from school and right. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a service and I'm not going to be there, I should probably let you know. Right. But uh, aside from that, I always um, keep that stuff, you know, internal and we do whatever it takes to make sure that on the customer end, it's taken care of. That's a good tip. I think uh, a good way to look at that is just always kind of keep, keep your game face on and yeah. always... Kind of hold your hold your cards close to your chest a little bit. Like uh, it's one thing I do all the time, and I think it's a good tip for a lot of people in life is try your hardest uh, in business at least to not let other people know how you feel or what your next move is. And even in social settings and and things like that, where it's not somebody that you feel like you should be vulnerable with or you should trust necessarily, keep them guessing. Keep everybody on their toes because um, and and don't let anybody know how you, this is, this is may or be, this may be good or this may be bad advice. And it it depends on how you apply and how you use it. But one of the most impactful things somebody ever told me was don't ever let anybody know how you feel. Now that didn't mean don't let my wife know how I feel, you know, looking back, but it's good because if what happens is when you let people know how you feel, you get emotional. When you get emotional, you get irrational. When you get irrational, you make stupid decisions. And then all of a sudden you become somebody that people can't trust. Yeah. So had you got emotional with your contracts, had you gone to the farmers and given them any so, sort of like uncertainty, like, I don't know if I can do this, I don't know if I can fulfill these contracts, or I can't, or I'm worried, oh, then yeah. all of a sudden, come next year, you're not getting the contracts. No, it's not what they want to hear with someone who's dealing with the, uh, you know, the viability of their crop potentially. So well, I think there's a lot of wisdom in that. I mean, he didn't, he didn't make his customers aware that, you know, he didn't make his problems his customers' problems. There you go. But if there was going to be a problem that affected his customers, I'm going to let him know. He was going to let him know. It's, 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 it's customer centric. A lot of wisdom. Yeah, you got to be customer centric, and in and I took it in the chops for my customer because a customer has to be first. If you don't prioritize that, especially uh, in a service business like you, yeah, like where your entire entire income is dependent on whether that customer is satisfied with your service. Yeah. Which, by the way, if you're listening and you have an opportunity to do a service or a sales business, 
sell a product. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Service businesses are hard. Yep, oh man. It and, monopolizes your time. I'm going to kind of double down on that. Sell a product worldwide. Be careful with brick and mortar. Yeah. But local easy businesses, on the retail. Like if you want to open up a, a local retail sporting goods store, just don't do it. Yeah. Don't. Yeah, unless you have like a vested interest in making main street of your town, like yeah. better, like don't do it. Cause that's right up there with service. You're it in is. a service industry. Yep. You're a restaurant or you're selling shoes at your local shop. You're still are in a service. You're Does this doing mean the Dave gets his El Camino back off the wall? Is yeah. that what you're trying to say? Yeah. <laughs> Bring that El Camino is not coming <laughs> down because then that creates a service for me where I have to have my guys, <laughs> my guys continue working on it. So, uh, you work on your own vehicles, don't you diesel? Yeah, I work on all my own vehicles with the help of all my friends in the shop. Right. Exactly. That was <laughs> Chief a great supervisor. way to put that. How long were you selling clothing apparel for before you had a brick and mortar? Uh, we only have a brick and mortar simply because there was a demand for it. We did not open. I mean, we've been selling apparel online since 2013. And the only reason we have a brick and mortar store is it's more or less kind of a showcase, like a, like a museum for us. And we have people who naturally come by from the TV show and want to buy stuff. Would I open a brick and mortar store hoping that people come by? No way. No, never. Yeah. So, uh, in Woods and so Cross. tell them, what's yeah. that? Woods Cross out in the middle of the <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> on, a, on a street that everybody doesn't drive on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know a thing or two about that. Marcus, let's check in for a minute. Where, where are you at? Are you just focused on how you have to cut this up or what? No, man. I'm, I'm here quiet. taking notes. You Marcus, tired? Is, I got a half page of notes going on. That, the thing about this is this is a foreign world to Marcus, like helicopters and running a business like this. I, I can see him literally just absorbing I'm it. trying to figure yeah, out where I get $3,300 so I can go take some lessons with Ryan <laughs> That's here. That's right. Yeah. Ryan, you available Actually, uh, dude, after you the can, show? Yeah, you got to jump in. So uh, Diesel and Heavy came up last summer, and uh, and, they, and they brought another buddy uh Jason, Jason. Right? Yeah. So we went out and did some two ships and flying around and had some fun on the water. And, uh, it was a great time. Great time. The best thing you can do in aviation is have a friend that's in aviation. <laughs> Are we friends now? <laughs> I, can I call you a friend? Yeah, yeah, that yeah. might awesome. be it now. <laughs> so growing your business, uh, to nine aircraft plus all the leasing that you do and yeah. all subcontracting. I actually, you know what, before we get to that, talk to me about the power lines in the Hiller. Hmm. This because a lot of things, one thing I, I love explaining to people how helicopters work because mm -hmm. there's a lot of mystery that surrounds them. People think they're just these magic time machines and they are, but they're also machines and they're thousands and millions of rotating parts and nuts and bolts. And there's a lot that goes into them. And one thing that you don't think about, you know, when you see a helicopter flying by, I never thought of this until I started flying is what happens if it hits a power line? Because helicopters fly low and if it flies through a canyon or wherever, there's power lines all over the place. Now for a, a crop duster or an ag pilot, the power lines are literally in your path every day. So, so oh. yeah. Yeah. Uh, in our environment we're I routinely turn, uh, within 10 feet of power lines all the time. I know that they're, uh, I'm choosing to manipulate the aircraft in close proximity. Uh, the incident that you're referring to, um, I was mean, it, the real issue is I didn't turn. How many years in the business was this? Was this so, year two? <laughs> Sadly, yeah, this, so I'm, I'm year two. So that's part of the double down, go big and, um, blind ambition and just Get feeling good, feeling good. But, uh, but also uh, it was one of those situations where the pilot that was supposed to be contracted to fly that aircraft and do the spring commitments that now I've made, um, flaked and, and did something else and he ended up going to Alaska. So now I've got spraying contracts and do I really know that much about spraying? No. Do I have a lot of experience? No, no, I don't. So I have enough to get my license and my ticket. Um, but I have to jump out there and go fly these fields. And this particular field parallels the river. And, um, I was saving this for last and for the day, uh, as a project. And at this time, uh, I'm dating my now wife and she's there. My best friend, my battle buddy from the army is there and they're loading for me. And, uh, so they're on site. What loading means is he's, he flies a helicopter. Basically they bring a truck and a helicopter to the field. Uh, helicopter goes out, sprays the, the, uh, stuff over the crops and then it tank gets empty because helicopters only carry so much fluid, a right. hundred gallons or so. And then it has to go back to this batch truck, which is full of, you know, thousands whatever of, it is. of whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And then you pump that into the helicopter and then you yep. go, you turn yep. and burn. So it's literally yep. turn and burn. You're, you're, you're landing at the truck every couple of minutes. Yep. So they're loading you. Yep. 
high reps. Uh, this this field is um, complex because uh, there's a, a wire obstacle that runs through the middle, and uh, telephone wire, basically power line. Well, and it's big. It's not even there was there's three uh, wires there, and they were big wires. Um, and you know, typically my game plan was to identify those wires, start there, paint, know where they were, fly back, come to them, and turn. And I started in on that path, and I changed at the last minute, um, which was just a bit of a rookie move looking back on it. And uh, I went back to the other end of the field and flew into the sun because of the way the traffic was driving on the highway. And so what that did is it impaired my vision on where that line was, and it was down the road. And I'm focusing really hard on, you know, holding my speed and being on the right row and all these things. And I think that line is coming up. Where is it? And I just started to pull up, but it was too late. And I caught the lines with the front portion of my skids. And, um, and they came together. And I very, very, very vividly uh, remember as this happened. It was almost like, you know, they say it's in slow motion when all right. this happens. But... Um, I knew there was a flash, and I knew instantly what that flash was. The lines are arcing together. The lines are coming together. They're arcing. And as it broke through my windshield um, and the power lines came into the cabin and hit my helmet, I thought, well, I am either going to back off of this and stall out and die and ball up into the power lines, or I have to push forward and pull as much power as I can and break through them and live and that's my best odds. See if you can land it. And that's what I did. Um, as it turns out, I was totally blessed. And the two different phases connected together on my GPS mount as it was breaking off and coming through my windshield, which allowed those two phases to arc mm. and cut the line. Jeez. And it broke across my visor that I had down because I was flying into the sun. And it cut through my side of my visor, which if I wouldn't have had that down, I'd be blind. Um, which would have been the least of my worries. Right. Um, and I was able to fly through it and uh, auto instantly into a clearing. Basically a crash landing. Yeah, we don't use that verbiage. Yeah, auto rotation in helicopters is basically <laughs> going to the ground with not having any power and not wadding up the helicopter, basically. Right, yeah. Um, so, and I landed, uh, covered up the aircraft, um, notified all the people that I needed to, and, and basically when I landed, I stood up, and walked out the front of the cabin. There was no... Ripped the whole front of the helicopter off? Ripped the whole I, I, front. The, the whole front of the cabin off. So you had your stick in your seat, and that was it? And just air. I walked, stood up, stepped around the instrument console, and walked out front. I didn't have to open the Zero door. injuries? Zero injuries. Did you re reconsider after that? No, actually... Meanwhile, his wife this, was watching this whole thing. Oh, oh my way. gosh. Oh. That's right. That's right. His so, wife watches him go in and this huge flash and bang and boom and then helicopter to the ground. Oh, that's right. I she forgot about this. probably yes. expected the worst. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I know it was horrible. So, and my whole focus here is, all right, I'm halfway through this guy's job and he's getting stop drop for harvest. I got to figure out how to get the PUD to get the power, you know, dealt with. And I got to find this guy and let him know that I'm not going to be able to finish his crop and I got to get this thing back in the shop and get it fixed because my customers, I'm so demented. It's, I just ripped the front of my helicopter off. Yeah, I gotta but get I got to get fixed like now. <laughs> I'm in deep doo-doo. So, uh, so we took it back and uh, I just dove into the process of, you know, getting the aircraft fixed and um, uh, dealing with the crisis that's in front of me where I just pulled, I snapped the power pole in half by pulling on the lines, Jeez. broke it in half. Was this your leased ship or one you owned? Uh, I did own it. Yeah, I just bought it. Um, and so now I, I owe the bank. I owe the PUD some number. I don't know yet. That's the power. Yeah, the public utility yeah. department. So I got to replace these power lines. Um, I'm hoping that the orchardist isn't going to be mad of some damage that I might have done to one of his trees. And if I call my insurance company, I didn't go back and reapply to dental school and did this business, and I'm quadruple, triple in on what I can afford to get out. And if I call the insurance company on this one, I'm going to be out of business. Yeah, you make a claim in aviation, and there's a good chance you're just done. I'm brand new. Yeah. I got like, yeah. Uh, 
it was a bad situation. How much and did it cost you? So the PUD, um, the power company, I told them, look, if, if I turn it in as a claim, then I'm out of business, so we're done. So why waste anybody's money and time? Or you can work with me, and I will 100% pay you, and I will not flake. You have my word. I will pay this off. Yeah. So it was a $25,000 bill. Um, and so I had to work, which, you know, new business. I just wrecked my helicopter. And uh, uh, by the way, I don't have any spare money. So that 25000 was no problem. I got lots of profits yeah. and yeah. no way to collect them. <laughs> right. So it was, it was a tough, um, it, it was a bleak uh, outlook on my business. And I was really second guessing what I was doing. Um, I love flying. And still to this day, I passionately love flying. Uh, but that was, that was a tough time. And then when you have an experience like that, it, it took me about two years. I was back in the cockpit in uh, two weeks, um, but I could barely fly. Yeah. Anytime I got near anything or something out of the corner of my eye, it was like my heart was jumping out of my chest and, and I had night tears and stuff. Yeah, you and dream about that. It was tough. Um, but eventually you get over it and you just, you know, can't let it rule your life. So you just hammer down. Simply because you have no option. <laughs> and there's that. I literally have no other option other than to just fold up, raise the flag and say, I surrender. But a lot of people do that. You can't do that. That happens a lot yeah. more than I think we realize is this happens to people, businesses, and they, like you said, throw up the white flag and they're done. And, and whoever is, is, you know, in the line of fire, as far as like the consequences of them not being able to pay bills, mm -hmm. they just have to deal with it. So bankruptcies, I mean, this happens all the time, day in and day out, but it doesn't happen to guys like you because you are not that type of person. You made a commitment, you made an obligation and you're going to fulfill it come hell or high water or another helicopter crash. Yeah. And so you did, you made it through that. And then from there, the next few years were just growing, 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 right? Just figuring yeah. out where to get better. Every year, um, I just kept doubling down. Uh, while it was getting me deeper and deeper in the wrong financial situation, <laughs> I was still flying. And I'm like, well, it's still working. Yeah, we're still doing kind it. Kind of, yeah. right? The doors are open. So I haven't lost yet. So I, I will say that I was super blessed also in that I had some really good mentors in aviation that um, not only helped teach me some certain skill sets that I, I brought in from, you know, being an athlete and stuff and, and, and adapted that to flying, um, but also helped me through these negative experiences that I was having. Okay, that right there is a checklist item that we're going to add because I can attest to the fact that you have a lot of mentors simply because you've used your mentors in our relationship, yeah. there's, I can't count how many times you've told me, let me call Pete, let yeah. me call Arnold, let me call Dane. You've got all these salty old guys that have been in the aviation business forever that you turn to mm -hmm. and they love and respect you and they literally pour information on you for free because you respect each other and you've, yeah. you, you know, you've helped them, they help you. So checklist item that I'm going to take away from this is find yourself a mentor and please do not do like everybody does online and go find the most famous person you can find mm -hmm. and say, will you be my mentor? Because I get hundreds and thousands of messages a day mm -hmm. saying, can I be, can I, can I, you know, job shadow you? Can we be my mentor? I'm sorry. It doesn't work like that. No. You have to start with, I heard Gary Vee say the other day, uh, somebody wanted to be a fashion intern and he's like, I want to go intern for, there's like the biggest name in fashion. And Gary Vee's like, okay, great. You got to start about 15 lowers below, 15 lay, uh, levels below him with the guy who has the fashion store on the corner. And then after you're good for him, he's going to introduce you to the guy who has the fashion store downtown. And then from there, that guy is going to introduce you to a manufacturer. And then you're going to find that dream mentor. But yeah. you're not going to just go knock on someone's door and say, teach me everything you know. I, there's nothing I hate more than it was this thing that went around for a long time where the self-help gurus were out there saying, go find the most successful people you know and pick their brain. Successful people don't want their brain picked. No. Not just for free, not just for, for, for a stranger. You have to figure out a way to provide value for them. And then yeah, you couldn't have just gone to some of these big operators, some of these big helicopter guys and no. said, teach me everything you know about this. Teach me all the tricks. Teach me how to get discount parts because they wouldn't have done it. You formed a relationship with them and then it got to that point. But 
what I want to tell you to do is go find yourself a mentor, but keep it realistic. This is where rather than setting some big lofty goal, you can set that goal, but just know that it's going to take you 10 or 15 steps to get to that person. And you're going to have to start at a lower level than what you expect. So uh, do not go message a bunch of celebrities. Don't go message a bunch of, don't go message, uh, you know, um, Warren Buffett and say, I want to pick your brain. It's not going to work. Yeah. It's and not you, realistic. Do we all have mentors here? I, I do. Yeah. I do not. We're going to get you one, Mark. I don't really We're have a mentor. You. I don't think you do, do you? No, because uh, I kind of created my own niche. Right. And so I just kind of learned and burned along the way, you know? True. Are you other people's mentors? You probably are. You know, I get yeah. that from young kids that see it, but it's kind of like that thing that Dave talks about where it's, you know, kids come with unrealistic expectations and they hit you up and they, they want everything that you have right away. And Entitlement. It yeah. Annoying. You know, and all they want to do is, is, is copy your business, basically. Yes. And steal it, you yeah. know. Teach yeah. me what you learn and then yeah. I'm going to go do it myself. That, that's not how this works, guys. If you're listening, you need to figure out a realistic way to get information. You have to extract information from somebody that has valuable information for you, but you have to do it in a clever way where you're providing value. Uh, yeah. yeah, that was my next point. I love that. I had to bring value to learn from my mentor. I, I learned a lot by bringing deals that we did together because they were good deals, and deals he said no to were probably deals I shouldn't do. But uh, the other thing about a good mentor is they're oftentimes – uh, not realizing how good of a mentor they are and that their mindset is that they're still learning. You know, if you find a mentor who tells you he's already made it and all these things, maybe find a different one, right? Because yeah. my mentor continues to add value in my life because he continues to grow. Yeah. I think you should talk a little bit more about that bringing value. Yeah. Because that's one thing when you probably get those emails, how many of them say, hey, I'd like you to be my uh, mentor, but here's what I'm willing to do for you. Well, Ryan, exchange, Ryan can you tell know? you. That's why Ryan's going with this, I think, is yeah. how did you form those relationships and well, get that information? So the, the one thing you're hitting on right there is mentors and relationships, plural. Yeah. So, you know, I don't, um, you have to start somewhere, right? You have to have a mentor to start you. But there's different people in my life that mentor me because they bring different experiences and different things to my life. So you got to you got to look at where you are at and think about you if you want to go sell coke you don't go to coke and say wait will you be my mentor I want to do what you do no you you got to have a a vast array of skills and awareness and different people in your life from sometimes unexpected places can come in and give you a great skill set um and, and it might be around business, it might be around personal, it might be around health and fitness. Um, there's all kinds of different areas that people can help you in, and it's not always just black and white. Can you think of any specific things that you did to form relationships with any of your mentors? So I, on multiple occasions, have sought out to learn something. I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, uh, paragliding. Mm -hmm. I, when I, I've got a real addictive personality, Okay. So when I, in a good way, this is how I positively shape an addictive personality. When I go to do something, I go 110% and it consumes my life until I get to a level where I can operate on a peer level with people that I started out, you know, really admiring or looking up to, right? So when I started uh, paragliding, I went to school and I said, hey, you know, I'm going to pay you to teach me to paraglide. And I met an instructor who's actually here in, in uh, Salt Lake, uh, Brad Ganuccio. He's just down at Draper, mm -hmm. and he's one of the world's best acro and cross-country pilots. And I met him, and I thought, man, this guy really knows what he's doing, right? I could learn a ton from this guy. Um, and so I just paid him the respect that he was due. I paid for his knowledge, right, which sometimes you have to do. You have to pay for someone's time, and it's a it's a – usually a equitable, fair trade. Right. Um, as we did that, we developed a personal relationship through those interactions. If it's a, let me go if back to a that. Good, if, if it's a good, if it's a good mentor, it's not an equitable and fair trade. You're getting way more from them than you're paying for. That's absolutely true. Right? Absolutely. And I, and I did. Uh, so don't look for fair deals because you can go, <laughs> buy, you can go buy a fair deal anywhere and just pay for knowledge and information, yep. just like college or right. any sort of training, but look for somebody who you can tell is really, really, really good at what you want to do. And obviously if they offer a, mm -hmm. a way to pay for that information, 
do it, but along the way, form that relationship right. and, and extract everything you can. I was a customer. Yeah. So he coaches camps, right? But he was the best coach out there. And I paid for those camps. But we also developed a relationship. And what I did is I started another business by building a tow boat for paragliding for doing these clinics. And I built a jet boat with a hydraulic winch system. I could tow people up 5,000 feet in the air. They'd pin off. Brad would coach them through the maneuvers. And I went into business with him and another buddy, and we did these SIV clinics. Right. And through that, um, Brad dispelled a whole bunch of knowledge on me and looked out for me. And we went flying. And you and didn't we were, pay for any of that. And that I never paid for. Right. We had a relationship and... And he had a respect and, and enjoyed being around me. Mm -hmm. And I was bringing something to the table, right? Because we had started a business venture together at that point. Um, and he really helped me out a lot and improved my, my flying and my skill set and my awareness and opportunities in the industry. It was really a, a cool experience. He ended up buying my boat and still does it. Now he's taking the business to a whole nother level. But I mean, to me, that's a perfect example of providing value. You did provide mm -hmm. value for him. I'll give you a few more examples of providing value. Marcus, in your business, all right? Let's say, uh, I remember one of your best uh, guys was Alex. Yeah, Alex David. Alex David. Dude still was talk to him. just the best, hardest worker. I just remember going to your events and Alex was not uh, looking over your shoulder trying to figure out how you were running music. He was at the door selling tickets. He was staying, he was getting there early and staying late, setting up, got to the point where he learned how to produce, right. And put together a better event. Right. Didn't he learn some of that stuff from yeah. you? Yeah. So funny thing about Alex is he didn't even come and like say, Hey, I want you to mentor me. Hey, I want you to, I want to be a part of your business. Hey, I want to get a job. Alex just showed up. Yep. And when we were building, you know, out the, the hangar and we were putting a store in there, he was the one who was there with the tools helping us do it. And he never asked to got paid. It was just kind of a natural thing where he kind of went from the guy who was showing up and helping. And then the first guy that we wanted to pay and the first guy we wanted to teach, it was him yeah. because he had already been invested. And it wasn't like a thing where he had to ask or we had to say anything. It was just kind of a natural deal because of the, the work and the effort that he put in. Yeah, he started you know? carving out just this little tiny spot for himself by doing, you know, putting yep. in the, putting in the work. Like we talked to the Redbeard, Redbeard came in and put in a bunch of sweat equity and free labor for months before I actually gave him equity in the company. Um, and that's exactly how it works. So if you are a young person, even an old person, I don't care what age you are, you can never have too many mentors or too much information, but there's a right way and there's a wrong way to go around, uh, you know, go find that person. So please, if you're listening, I want you to deliberately look around you or look in your environment or look in your area or your, your city, wherever you live, and look at people who are doing what you want to do. If you see somebody who owns a helicopter business and you want to learn how that works, I want you to figure out a way to approach them, go to them and say, can I clean your helicopters for free or for a discount after hours? Can I sweep your shop floor? Whatever it is. And I know that sounds cliche and it's, you know, started off sweeping the floor, but they say it for a reason. That stuff happens for a reason. Like you don't make it to the top on day one. You have to figure out a way to get in the door. And then you can start building that relationship. So that is probably one of the most powerful things you can do in life is find people that are smarter, more successful, more experienced, more seasoned. Uh, yeah, it's especially a valuable thing when you're talking pilots because seasoned pilots are guys who have hit the power lines. They're guys who have, you know, crash landed aircraft. They're the guys that have actually, you know, learned from trial and error. Those are the guys you want to be learning from. The first guy who ever taught me how to fly a helicopter, his name was Orv. Orv was 65 years old, and I flew from Tennessee to Utah with him. And I learned more in those two and a half days than I could learn in six months of training. Because oh. he's just a salty old guy, like you say, and he just would tell me, you know, there's there's old pilots and there's bold pilots, but there's no old, bold pilots. I mean, he yeah. was one of the old guys that was like just teaching it like it is. So find those people and surround yourself with them, but find a way to make it appealing to them to give you that information because you, they're not going to give it to you otherwise. It's just not going to happen. So uh, what other, since we're kind of nearing the end here, Ryan, um, what other nuggets of wisdom would you give to people? And it doesn't even have to do with their career or anything. Just this podcast is all about figuring out ways to give people um, kind of a jump start. Yeah. Help them avoid some of the obstacles that, you know, we commonly encounter in life. So whether it be health and fitness, whether it be, um, you know, business and entrepreneurship, whether it be family values, what are the things have you done in your life that you can attribute to, 
you may feel like you're still in the grind, but I look at you and I know that you're successful. You just bought a big, another operator up in your area. You bought his business. You're running his contracts. You're adding more aircraft to your fleet. You're getting to the point where you're getting those big, juicy, nice contracts for service stuff. How do you get there? You eat an elephant one bite at a time. So I'm still grinding. I, it's funny that you say that because I, I look at it and I'm like, oh man, I see all these people that are so successful and they're doing all these amazing things. Yeah, but guess what? We don't have, we don't have <laughs> average individuals on this podcast. We bring in high level, high yep. operating people. So whether you see it or not, it's happening and you are. Yeah. And, and that's how you do it. You, you have to, first of all, put yourself in the opportunities um, in an arena where opportunities will come your way. So if you have a goal to be in a particular industry, you need to find ways, however humbling the task may be, you just need to be in the show. Sometimes just sitting on the outside and observing, you can learn a lot. And that familiarity will grow into opportunity and opportunity builds on more opportunities. And before you know it, you'll start developing, if you have a, a sincere desire and passion for what you're doing, other people are going to pick up on that and you're going to develop some great relationships. And if you're open to that and respectful to what other folks are doing, regardless of where you're at on that ladder, um, some really amazing things are going to happen. You're a good example of it's never too late to start because at 32, you yeah. kind of started over. You just had your first kid at 38. Yeah. Uh, that's kind of old to be a dad for the first time. <laughs> I mean, it, to, it is. Yeah. But it, you know, I, I, I exchanged that for a lot of experiences that I did in my twenties. Right. I had a lot of, um, selfish experiences, I guess, as a, as an athlete and to be successful in that, you got to be very selfish with your time. Um, so I wasn't able to explore some of those other blessings with having a family and, and, uh, having some of these other social opportunities. So moving into business, um, I think, gives me some more, it's that constant competition, no matter where you're at, there's always another level and another place you can take stuff. So that's very stimulating for me. Um, and as you go along, you know, we're talking about mentors, just to circle back around to that, finding people that can help you and shorten your learning curve. That's, that's what a mentor does. They so, shorten your learning curve. I mean, you probably realize this. I don't know how many people realize this, but you are a mentor to me. You've taught me safe ways to fly. You've taught me more economical ways to own and operate and fix mm -hmm. helicopters. You've taught me, you, you're the one that taught me what a BO-105 was and, and yeah. now I own one because of I you. I know, it's sweet, huh? It, it's the I sweetest. Told you, I mean, I'm telling told you, you that was the one. And people look at that and they're like, dude, you own a, that's a $2 million helicopter. And I'm yeah. like, nope, that thing, it's a, about a $300,000 helicopter. That's, that's right. what I paid for. And we found ways to, to do that. Mm -hmm. But I didn't come to you and just say, dude, Teach me everything there is to know yeah. about helicopters. You just tried to sell him a junk I helicopter. I tried to sell him a lemon, yeah. and he, he, he <laughs> I turned, called him out on it. He turned the lemons into lemonade for us, yeah. and we ended up having that relationship. But I mean, that's that's how mm -hmm. it works: is find somebody who has that information and knowledge. And I, honestly, that's going to be the only checklist item that I let you give us because it is the biggest and the most like comprehensive. Because there's so much that goes into yeah. it. Yeah. Um, but if you're a young listener, I, I keep saying that. If you're a listener, I don't care how old you are, go find that person. So. We're going to wrap it up right now with the checklist. Item number one, find a mentor, but provide value to be able to get their information. Do not, do not, do not go just go knock on a bunch of high profile or rich people or celebrities doors and say, I want to learn everything there is to know about you because it's not going to work. It's just not going to work. One thing I've done that I, I feel um, very good about as a, as a, you know, kind of makes me feel like I'm, I'm doing the right things that I've been able to achieve, I guess, certain things is that I have been able to hire uh, two of my mentors. Yeah. And it's a powerful thing to be able to work with them uh, every day and still continue to absorb that knowledge. That, that is actually, that is a good trick. If you're a business owner and you have the ability to hire people, go find the salty old Vietnam pilots and put them in one of your helicopters and, you know. Uh, absorb, 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 absorb. I've got way more talented people working for me than what my actual skill set is. Yeah. And and that's a, a really good thing. If you're at the point where you have employees, seek out people that you can learn from. Can I add something? Yep. Let me ask you a question then. In in your whole process of building your business through mentors, did you ever steal any business from any of your mentors? Hmm, interesting. Uh, no, I did not. And actually many of my mentors were not in my same business. 
I was obtaining skill sets that allowed me to achieve my goals through the experiences yep. that they had, uh, that they were able to bestow. And, on me. and I think that that's key because yeah. I'm, I imagine, cause I get it through my business. People will basically send me messages saying, Hey, I want to do what you do. Can I learn what you do so I can do it? Yeah. You don't no, go I don't and approach want to teach someone. My exactly. I'm in business. Exactly. This is how I make a living, man. And, and so I think that that's a key part is just keeping in mind that when you're looking for a mentor, they probably don't want to hear that they yeah. that you want to do exactly what they do and take their business. I agree. Right. Especially it's, in a niche business like yours where right. competition is real. As soon as you throw a New Year's party and then your competition throws a New Year's party, well, your revenue goes in even, half. Even going a little bit further, I mean, I don't know how many helicopter pilots dry cherry cheat trees. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. right? Yep. Yeah. And so, I mean, so if people approach you, kind of same thing. It's know? always flattering for people to emulate. Don't imitate. Yeah. Don't take somebody and try to imitate what they're doing. It is flattering to emulate certain characteristics and things and processes they do, but make that your own thing. Yeah, copy and paste only works on the computer. That's right. It doesn't work in real life because then you try to become something you're not, and then also you wind up stealing information that it just doesn't work. The way you don't try know to what to do with it. it. Yeah, you don't know what to do with it. You're not that person. You didn't develop that program. So that's awesome. Um, number, number two, three, and four, these items on the checklist I'm going to give to you guys are items that I just have on my daily checklist. They're things that are extremely important to me. They're very basic, very simple. And these are lifestyle things, guys, that are going to help you feel better, live better, sleep better. I think sleep is so underrated these days. People just go, 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 go get yourself eight or nine hours of sleep. And that's not the checklist item, but what I'm going to tell you is going to help you get that sleep. And it's put your phone away 30 minutes before bedtime. Do not. So I've heard that people go even to an extreme as far as they put their phone in a different room than where they sleep because phones emit blue light. Blue light is extremely hard on your eyes. It's extremely hard for your body and your brain to process. It, it, it requires the, like this intense amount of focus. And it literally, best way to put it, and best, like the most simple way to, to explain it is it's burning your eyes, okay? It's not going to kill you immediately. It's not gonna, it, may ne it may never hurt you in your entire lifetime, but it does affect your brain and the way that you sleep. So put your phone away. 30 minutes before bedtime, and this is really hard for me because that's some of my like best like go time is, is having my phone. And so, you know, some of these people, the scientists who've taught this theory say, don't watch TV, don't have your computer out, don't have your phone out. And if you've got like crazy, like self-control, great, more power to you, do that. But start with your phone, just put it away because the, the, even the way that your phone causes your posture to go, you curl up in this little ball your thumbs curl in, your arms curl in, you put your face down and it's not healthy. So just put your phone away, which leads me to my next item. Number three on the checklist is don't touch your phone for 30 minutes in the morning. <laughs> you know what you did for me by hanging out with you that I've, I've taken is you're a guy that is, uh, everybody's trying to get a moment of your time, right? right? Monopolize. And so one of the things I learned very early with you is that you put your phone on silent. Do not disturb. Do not disturb. So it goes right to voicemail. Yep. So it makes you not readily available for everybody's need all the time. You can't distract me. I started implementing that and doing that. So I, I, I do that in the evening yep. when I get home and it's family time, I put it on do not disturb. Yep. When I wait and I, I do that until about business hours, like seven in the morning. Right. Life changer. Yep. I don't get random texts or email alerts or phone calls. I have to choose to engage in that conversation and um, it gives me back my family time and my rest that you're talking about. Yep. So you, thank you, you for have, teaching me that yeah, one. I mean, I, that's that one of the biggest things that I preach. And I preached it when we were on the uh, MFCEO podcast with Andy Frazella is uh, put your phone on, do not disturb, turn off all your notifications um, and just like make your phone respect you rather than you having to respect your phone. Like whenever it needs your attention, you have to give it to it. No. No. So what I mean by that is make the people who are trying to contact you respect your time. Yeah. I mean, back in the olden days, you didn't call people outside of nine to five. No. You just did. Like, I remember when I was a kid growing up and somebody called at eight o'clock at night. It was like, holy shit, fire alarms. <laughs> like, who? why is somebody calling me? Somebody's this is this is a big deal. Down. Exactly. Someone's bars burning down. That's the only reason you should be calling somebody that late at night. So do it. Uh, and then in the morning, that's a big one. Because in the early uh, years of my business, I used to just, and I think we're all guilty of this, I would wake up. Literally, first thing, reach over, grab my phone, pull it up to my face, and whether I went and read texts or most, you know, commonly, I would just go through and go through social media. I would find myself ten pages deep on Instagram before I was even getting out of bed, and whatever I saw in those ten pages, 
was basically directly influencing how I felt that day. Yeah. And you're either going to see good or you're going to see bad. And if you allow yourself to be open to that, your brain gets hardwired to whatever you see on your phone influences your whole day. You get a bad text from somebody, you get an email from a bank that says your payment's late, whatever it is, that's going to basically trigger you and set you off for the entire day. So do not allow yourself to access that information until you've woken up and given yourself a proper morning routine, which leads me to checklist item number four. And it's so basic, guys. It's so freaking simple. And I could give you a whole morning routine that, and we'll get into this more, but number four is do not do anything right after you bet. And like, here, let me back this up. Get out of bed immediately. Don't touch your phone. Go to the kitchen, get a glass of water, a full glass of tap water and drink it. Like, like not freezing cold, not super hot. The best thing I found is just kind of room temperature, maybe a little colder if you can't drink room temperature water and drink it. Something about drinking a full glass of glass of uh, water in the morning basically triggers, it kind of gets your, your system going. It gets, uh, you'll find that you'll wind up going to the bathroom sooner. You'll wind up going to taking your morning dump, like on like a, literally like on a schedule, like just on a, on a freaking clock. Um, so guys, this is super important stuff and it's so basic. And I think it's things that we all forget how to do. Like a lot of people will wake up and they'll get their phone. They'll hang out. They'll go have whatever it is, but it's not water. You know, they'll go have a bowl of cereal. I'm telling you right now, back it up, go have that water. I'm dude, something about it. Just literally like sparks your body into going. I don't know what it is. I, I know that there's science behind it. I can't remember, you know, what I read about that, but scientifically proven to just feel better. And it's so freaking simple because that's the point of the podcast. I want to give people very basic and simple marching orders, things that they can do right away. Later, I mean, if you're listening to this tomorrow morning, you can go get your glass of water. Tonight, you can put your phone away and tomorrow morning, you can you know not touch it for 30 minutes. These are simple things, but they make a huge difference. I said this on uh, Andy's podcast. First time I did the whole phone thing in the morning, I remember I sat down and I started eating my breakfast and my phone was not even anywhere nearby. Dude, I started like looking out the window. I started like, <laughs> oh my gosh, there's a world dude, out yeah, there. I started like noticing the birds and I started like thinking and my brain was like, my phone wasn't doing the thinking for me. My brain actually had to think to keep myself entertained. Dude, it was, it's the coolest experience. And if you're on your phone a lot, you're going to know exactly what I'm talking about. Like this is going to hit you hard. You'll probably get a lot more like, action at home with your wife too. Yeah, you know, dude, if you give your wife <laughs> that 30, yeah. dude, even if you give your wife 30 minutes before bedtime. I guarantee you, if you have even... You're going to get lucky. Any, Yeah, you're either going to get lucky or even better than that. I don't know if it's better than that, but you're going to fix problems work. in your marriage. Like if it, like that 30 minutes is a lot of time to be able to like work through stuff if you're giving your wife your undivided attention. That's a big thing. So do it, guys. Those are the things. Find a mentor. Put your phone away 30 minutes prior to bedtime. Do not touch your phone for 30 minutes in the, in the morning. And number four, go straight to the kitchen. And if you want to drink cold water, it's fine. I don't think there's anything against cold water. I just found that room temperature water triggers my body and gets things going much more quickly. It just like wakes me up. So do that. Um, and then obviously we've given you other uh, tips and tricks about your morning routine as far as cold showers and stuff like that. And if you ever want to learn more about uh, these routines and these different you know checklist items, at the end of every single podcast, just go to the end, listen to the last, what is it, 10 minutes or so, and you'll catch these checklists. And we're going to find a way to publish these checklists as well, uh, potentially in a book or some sort of like uh, format where it's easy to read, go through and bam, 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 start st uh, you know stacking these things up because everybody in this room has started to implement these things. And I feel better. You guys feel better? Absolutely, man. It's been amazing what it's done for my life. It, not only just <clears throat> being able to sit here as friends, talk. But implementing all these things in my life, I've noticed a difference. And some of it is a, is a crash course and refreshing what we've talked about and what we've learned over the years. But uh, we're always learning more from the people we have on here and from each other, right? Like, I mean, the affirmations was a good eye opener. I mean, there's a reason why Diesel Dave has a pile of stones uh, and crystals sitting in front of him. And Marcus is wearing a bracelet with stones on it. Dave... Real quick, I know on Redbeard's podcast, we talked about uh, tracking down some stones and whether you believe it or not, just go do it and find some stones with some energy that you want. What have you got there? I got a stack of stones that have energy that I want. You know, I, uh, How many you got? Oh, I don't know. There's what? Eight of them there? So, uh, some, that, <laughs> some that give you positive thoughts, some that are supposed to be uh, abundant stones that get you abundance of whatever you want, I guess, attract in life. abundance and wealth. You got uh, ones that get rid of negativity in your life, ones that make you more imaginative. And, you know, I don't, I've never really been a believer in the stones. Never, just learned about them last week, and I figured, why not? Why not give it a shot? And what's funny is each one of these stones, I don't think the stones 
really giving me the energy, but that's where my mind is focused now on what each one's supposed to be doing, which is then creating that reality of it's actually Your happening. brain is creating this energy, yeah. yep. and you're using the stone as basically a reminder. And, and scientifically, you know, Redbeard and, and the like other, other people talk about stones that actually have an energy and a vibration, and I'm sure that, that exists, but even if you don't believe in that, here's a simple way to start. Just get some nice, beautiful stones, and every time you see them and touch them, you're going to feel that good energy. It's just like your affirmations. If your brain's thinking it all the time, that is what is going to happen. Yep. So if you want to learn more about that, that was on last week's episode of the podcast, episode number seven with Redbeard. I believe it's titled, Are You Stoned? Or something like that. And it was... Get stoned with Redbeard. Get stoned with Redbeard. Whatever it is, <laughs> it is it is phenomenal. Like, guys, uh, we learned a lot with that. But we are out of time, and we just want to thank you because what you guys do for us, allowing us to be able to create and build this community and this platform, it really helps us. Like it's almost, we almost do this out of selfish motives because every single time we sit here and talk into these microphones, we become better people. And hopefully you as a listener are feeling the exact same way. And the relationship is reciprocal and it's not just give, 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 or take, take, take. It's give, take, give, take. And we're friends and we are basically creating a giant family and a community of people, like-minded people who want to succeed, who want to have happiness and want to make the world a better place. And with that said, I'll see you guys next week.